ओके इट्स ऑलमोस्ट सिक्स टू गाइज वी विल क्विकली स्टार्ट विदाउट एनी फर्दर डीले फर्स्टली वेलकम बैक वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन चैनल स्कॉलर्स एंड या सिंस इट्स मंडे इट्स बेसिकली अ क्लास फॉर स्टैंडर्ड ट्वेल्व एंड फर्स्टली गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग आई एम होपिंग एवरीबडी इज हैविंग अ गुड स्टार्ट टू द वीक ओके सो दैट बींग सेड जस्ट वॉन्ट टू गिव यू अ हेड्स अप दैट दिस इज गोइंग टू बी द लास्ट सेशन फॉर चैप्टर थ्री चैप्टर सेवन विच इज एन इम्पीरियल कैपिटल विजयनगरा सो या इट्स द लास्ट पार्ट पार्ट थ्री ओके आई थिंक अ कपल ऑफ यूर ऑलरेडी ह्यूर आई एम होपिंग अदर्स विल जॉइन इन द नेक्स्ट टू थ्री मिनट्स बट इन द मीन वाइल आई एल क्विकली डू द इंट्रोडक्टरी पार्ट um firstly uh, good evening guys and my name is nikita and i'm the history educator here at an academy scholars channel mm-hmm. i take classes for both standard 11th and 12th and as far as my educational qualifications are concerned i have recently graduated from ashoka university with a bachelor's degree i have a major in history and a minor in political science um Okay uh Preeth is here with us. Hi Preeth, good evening. Uh talking quickly about an academy's plus features, you can actually learn live from the comfort of your own houses. There's unlimited access to all of these courses and these are taught by top educators of India and all of them are available on one single platform. Then there are regular doubt clearing sessions, answer writing sessions, practice tests and live test series. there's exhaustive coverage of syllabus mentorship and guidance along with access to study materials which are usually in the form of pdf and then we have plus pricing which we where we have uh, six ranges of subscriptions starting from 6 months to almost 24 months the prices you can see on the left side are um, are the actual prices you can use a code which is tum10 and get a 10% off and these are the post discounted prices so talking about iconic we have features like personal mentorship live doubt solving sessions weekly reports study planners and also direct parent connect for so for iconic pricing we have nine different subscriptions uh, ranging from 3 months to 48 months these are the actual prices these are the post discounted same like plus uh next there's something called as emerge it's basically a test conducted every week and you all can also take part in this the format of the test is aligned with the latest cbse guidelines so it must act as some kind of practice thing for your term one boards it's highly helpful uh the link for that is in the description below of this video so please go enroll yourselves and take part in the quiz um yeah so with that being said i think it's time to uh, step into the actual content for today where we'll be discussing about um, the other buildings of the royal center then we'll move on to sacred center and then we'll finally end the chapter by discussing about the um, discovery of hampi or vijayanagara empire in the first place how did that happen right so these are roughly the sub themes um at any point of time you all have any questions regarding uh, anything like the whole chapter syllabus whatever it is just uh, feel free to um text in the chat box i'll quickly answer them okay um cool i will start so the last class we were basically talking about maha navami dibba which is a very very important uh, complex or a place belonging to the royal center right so as i was telling you the city as a whole was divided into uh, three important uh, dis- distinctions the first one is the urban core where everybody like normal ordinary people lived we've talked about that the second one is royal center we've talked about mahanavami dibba in the last class the other buildings will be covering today which are a part of the royal center and after that we'll talk about the sacred center right so that's roughly um the distinctions and yeah we'll start with royal center second part so 
other than mahanavami dibba we also have um, very very nice and aesthetic buildings in the royal center one of that is lotus mahal right so again you we, we also have to remember that lotus mahal or the name of lotus mahal is something that british travelers gave while they were here in india in the 19th century right but what was this building called before 19th century or what name did vijayanagara people give to it we don't really know yeah we only know that it is the name given by british travelers in the 19th century it is the most beautiful building right so um i mean lotus mahal right it the name in itself sounds kind of very uh, appeasing or romantic and all that stuff but honestly speaking historian historians were not able to figure out what is the purpose of this building or what was it used for in those times so we don't really know what the purpose was but just the name and that too Brit- britishers gave it right um obviously history is a place for speculations so most of the historians were trying to figure out what this place is but they couldn't come up with a certain conclusion but nonetheless one of the most believed theory is um that Mah- lotus mahal has been a place for um, the king to meet his advisors or his courtiers right which we basically called as council chamber the spelling is here it's council chamber but again this is not something which is a fact people are, historians are just speculating about it on the basis of what mackenzie drew in his initial map right so it's just a speculation um again um usually we had a sacred center and going by the name all of us think that sacred center is the places where most of the temples are constructed but surprisingly even in the royal center we have so many temples constructed right we look at few of those temples in the next slides but um yeah in the meanwhile in this particular slide if you have any questions uh, feel free to ask um uh, okay you can type down your questions guys in case you'll have any uh, otherwise i'll move to the next slide okay um uh, so one of the most spectacular of these when i mean these i'm basically referring to temples so out of all of these spectacular temples which have been there in the royal center the most famous is hazara rama temple right hazara rama temple but why was it the only, the, the famous thing because honestly speaking this is one such kind of temple where only the royal people which is basically the king's family used to go and worship in this temple but other people were not allowed to go inside even though they are rich even though they are elite people like landlords uh ministers um courtiers professionals doesn't matter nobody is allowed except for the king and his beloved family right so that is why it is a very different temple uh so the story of the temple goes as such that um it was constructed way back in 14th 15th century only but when the sev- um battle of tallikota happened in 1565 um when actually dekni dekni sultanates came and invaded vijayanagara they destroyed this temple right so if you want to go now and explore um this hazara rama temple you won't find it because it's already in ruins dekni sultanate people destroyed the temple uh but again whatever statues are there in the central shrine like the main complex building those have been gone but nonetheless the walls still survive right so if you go and visit the temple right now in 21st century you will only find the walls of the temple wherein you will have all of these paintings which depict the episodes or scenes from ramayana right so by this what do we understand 
that Hazara Rama temple is a Rama temple, right? I mean, even the name says, right, it's a Rama temple. Yeah, so that's the story of this whole temple. But um, Riyaz has a question. Um, Riyaz, I honestly don't know uh, the answer to your question. You have to check it out yourself, Riyaz. Okay, uh, Roshan is here with us. Hi, Roshan. Um, okay, so uh, we've just talked about Hazara Rama Temple. While most of the structures at Vijayanagara were destroyed when the city was uh, stagged, honestly speaking, there was brutal destruction, right? Deccani Sultanates were so tired, were so angry and frustrated on Vijayanagara people that they destroyed every possible thing that they saw in their way. Be it houses, be it monuments, temples, huge structures, the palace itself, right? Everything was destroyed by Deccani Sultanates. Yeah. But um, nonetheless, after the destruction, which is after 1565, there was still... Um, ruling in the eastern part towards the Tirupati side right and there were we also had like Nayakas and all also like people succeeding Vijayanagara empire they were so fascinated by the temple architecture that they still continued to build all build all of these massive structures with nice decorations elegant sculptures beautiful paintings right all of these huge uh, aesthetic things were still being followed after 1565 as well so that basically means most of those buildings have survived so even if you look at these buildings you'll get a rough idea as to what the Vijayanagara architectural style is yes so um, yeah that's the um, royal center we had we just had those two slides two slides to cover for royal center with that, we finished two subtopics, which is the Royal Center and the uh, Urban Core. Now we'll move on to discussing about the Sacred Center. As the name suggests, Sacred is basically a place where we, all the temples are there. It's like a religious thing. Right? So, um, yeah. Before talking about the Sacred Center, if you'll have any questions about the other two, which is Urban Core and uh, the other one, sorry royal center any questions please feel free to ask okay uh divya is here hi divya <laughs> hi faizan good evening i am doing amazingly well roshan thanks for asking how are you Uh, okay, if there are no questions, then I can start talking about the sacred center. Yeah, so uh, the first sub theme under the sacred center is choosing a capital, right? So, um, again, when we can come to the physical location of the sacred center, as I was telling you that the whole city, like let's say, let's roughly consider this is the whole city of Vijayanagara. On one side, we had the urban core. Uh, on one side, we had the royal center. Now it's time to locate where the sacred center is. So when it comes to sacred center, it's basically in the northern end of the city. It's basically this part. Right? So that's the uh, like brief location of where sacred, sacred center was and the terrain of this northern place is as such that it's totally a very rocky and hilly region. Right? Mountains are there because that's a Deccan plateau. Right? So, so many hills, Nandi hills, like random hills were there. Yeah. So. Uh, yes, Roshan, uh, I know that everybody has an exam on 20th December and I'm hoping preparations are going well. I mean, there's hardly like 20 days time. 
so please guys make why make wise utilization of your time and study well <laughs> yeah um but it's it's going to be pretty easy nothing to worry about it's majorly an mcq test you'll have been practicing a lot uh in the school here random tests revisions one shot revisions and stuff like that so there's nothing to like seriously worry about if your preparation is on track so i'm hoping y'all will do well <laughs> roshan definitely i'll i'll definitely like hoping that all of y'all will do well and honestly yeah it's just an easy thing which you don't have to worry about i am i'll be i'll definitely be very happy if all of y'all score well in your exams um okay cool so we're basically talking about uh, the northern hilly region and we have so many puranas and all that stuff all that stuff right like tradition traditional texts of uh, hindu religion especially ramayana so it says that um, in again if you'll have any um, knowledge about ramayana you will know that there are two kingdoms mentioned in ramayana which is vali and sugriva right the spellings are here vali and sugriva are basically kingdoms they they were mentioned in ramayana again we don't know whether ramayana is a historical fact or a fictional story so people whoever want to believe either ones it's fine but it's just what the tradition says that these two kingdoms of vali and sugriva are actually uh like they actually ruled from these northern hills right so it's exactly the same place where the where this vijayanagara city is also located yeah so just like a geographical reference um there are some other traditions also which say that pampa devi who is supposed to be like the local mother goddess of vijayanagara empire she did so she so dedicatedly she medi- meditated or like she did penance there in these northern rocky hills for what like again when you're doing a meditation you have some final objective which you want to achieve so her objective is to marry virupaksha who is virupaksha he is also a god he's like a guardian deity of the kingdom but in some sense virupaksha is always associated to be a form of shiva just like how vishnu has all of these dashavataras like krishna rama all that stuff in the same manner shiva also has few forms out of which virupaksha is one and pampa devi wanted to marry virupaksha and that is why she was meditating all this while that also happened in the sacred center which is the northern hills right um to this day like even in the 21st century the local people of karnataka or that particular region they celebrate their union or the marriage of pampa devi and uh, virupaksha it's a big thing right like even in hindu festivities we have certain other festivals where we celebrate the union of different gods like let let it be shiva's marriage let it be rama's marriage we all have these different um, festivals in the same manner local people also celebrate this festival or union of virupaksha and uh, pampa devi um alongside these hindu temples in the same place you will actually find other jain temples as well but these jain temples were not built during 14th 15th centuries but were built much much earlier right so whatever the situation is looking at so many temples not just hindu temples but also jain temples um people started calling this as a sacred center something related to religion that's how the name sacred center came into being yeah um okay so moving on to the next slide still talking about the royal cent- uh, sacred center so we we basically talking about temples so when it comes to construction of temples honestly speaking constructing temples is not a new thing right 
we have been constructing temples for a really really long time and the earliest traces can go back to Pallavas, Chalukyas, Hoysalas and Cholas when all of these people were ruling they actually started this tradition of building these huge temples right so it goes way before Vijayanagara people um, again another interesting thing is rulers were very often encouraged to build these temples uh, it's not just because they had so much money but they had some motive they had some objective that incentive for them to construct so many temples because they always wanted to associate themselves with the divine sometimes they claimed that they are the sons of god sometimes kings used to say that we are gods ourselves right or god sent us to rule the earth on behalf of him stuff like that some sort of association with the god or with the divine um so in order to make people believe that they constructed all of these temples and stuff there there was a clear justification people didn't just randomly construct because they had money right there was a reason so when all of these temples were coming up which were very very huge they eventually became functions or uh, they eventually became centers of learning right when i mean learning it's not just uh, traditional learning or like uh, vedic learning and all that stuff but also like normal schooling right even that used to happen at, in the temple premises itself or like no, normal local education just how the life works um, how to lead your life happily something like that some random learning used to happen within the temples when people used to like gather and talk to each other so besides that rulers and others often granted land and other resources for the maintenance of temple so it's not just kings who are investing in um, construction of temples but also other rich people in the kingdom they also used to fund like a little money or they used to grant some piece of land or grant some money for the maintenance or repairing of the temples right so everybody thought it's their moral responsibility to construct as well as maintain temples right so everybody were basically two religions so because of this because everybody is taking part in uh, temple activities temples eventually developed as significant religious social cultural and economic centers they are like various uses right usually temples are only for religious purposes but in this case there are also social centers cultural centers and economic centers yes so yeah on the other hand the reason why rulers are constructing temples is because they wanted to win over their subjects or audience they wanted their people to think that the ruler is a very good man he is a religious man he is a very friendly amicable ruler right to to create good impression in the hearts of people that's the basic purpose yeah so any questions still here guys as to why temples are constructed and who started this trend of constructing temples uh, any questions uh, please let me know again i if there are no questions probably we can go ahead yeah so um now we'll basically come to the existence of vijayanagara city right like why that particular place why not other place in the entire kingdom why only that place has to become the capital the reason being in this particular place we have shrines of virupaksha and pampa devi virupaksha temple and pampa devi temple which are very huge and famous virupaksha and pampa devi were very very influential figures in the running of the administration of vijayanagara empire that they decided their capital of vijayanagara city 
solely based on the existence of their temples. Just because Virupaksha and Pampadevi temple are in that place, they made it their capital. That's how important these two deities were for Vijayanagara rulers. Vijayanagara rulers, honestly speaking, were very, very religious. Right? So, in fact, another surprising thing is these Vijayanagara kings, they claim to rule on behalf of the god Virupaksha. They're like, we're not ruling you. God Virupaksha actually has some plans for you. Like he wants this empire to be run on so and so lines. And we are just his messengers. Yeah, we are just doing his work. We are ruling on behalf of Virupaksha. So these are the statements made by Vijayanagara kings. Right? Um, everybody like Sangama, Salua, Tulua, Aravidu kings. Everybody associated their administration with Virupaksha. So, also, another point to tell you that Virupaksha and Pampadiri were actually important or influential. So, one thing is, whenever you are issuing any um, rules or regulations or farmans, as we say in the context of Delhi Sultanate and Mughal rulers, or any sort of royal messages or charters, right? you usually sign those documents by writing your name. Right? Even now in the 21st century, when we are writing a letter or a mail or anything like that, we usually sign off by saying your own name, right? Like your name. But surprisingly, these Vijayanagara rulers, they were so dedicated, like they were so um, like huge devotees of Virupaksha that they usually issued all of these order under Virupaksha's name. Right? They wrote whatever message they want to and finally issued by Virupaksha. They signed off by Sri Virupaksha. Right? So that's again uh, um, a good thing. Again, when I mean good thing, I'm basically saying regarding the connection between Vijayanagara people and Virupaksha. Yeah. Rulers also indicated their close links with the gods by using the title Hindu Sura Ratna. Yeah. Um, again, if you, this Sura Ratna is like a Sanskritization of a particular term. What is that term? It's basically Sultan. Sultan, we have been hearing this word Sultan for a really, really long time now. It's basically an Arabic term, which means king. All of us know that. So when we are referring to the word Hindu Sura Ratna, we're basically literally translating it to something called as Hindu Sultan. Sultan in itself is like a Muslim word, Islam word. But we are giving it a Hindu Sultan title. Right? So that's what Vijayanagara uh, emperors used to do. Even as they drew on earlier traditions, the rulers of Vijayanagara innovated and developed these. Like for example, we've, we've been seeing how in terms of temple architecture or like other normal architectures and stuff, um, Vijayanagara, Empire, Vijayanagara rulers have been drawing on from Islamic traditions and that's how the Indo-Islamic art came into being. But honestly, they just didn't copy it. They might have borrowed some ideas, but at the same time, they modified them or redefined them. They developed it according to their own convenience. So that sort of modification is there. It's not just mere copy. And also royal portrait sculptures were now displayed in temples, right? Like king's images were installed in temples. And whenever king is trying to like visit a temple for worship or any other purpose, donating grants, worshipping, just going and just going with his family and chilling or something like that. Whenever king used to visit, it's like a huge deal, right? There's a huge uh, fuss usually made out of this particular activity. And he just didn't go alone. Obviously, his guards were there, his family was there. But on the other side, side, important nayakas of the empire were also there. All of them used to go together and worship. Right? So, yeah, that's that. Any questions still there? Because we're done with um, the first sub-theme of Royal Centre. 
Next, we'll be talking about Gopurams and Mandapas. What are they? Where were they constructed and all? But still here, any questions, guys? Uh, okay, I don't see any. Cool. So, we'll start uh, talking about Gopurams and Mandapas. We're basically referring to temple architecture because Gopurams and Mandapas are not constructed at homes. These are the special structures constructed only for a temple, right? So, these Gopurams and Mandapas have already been there by Vijayanagara time, right? These included structures of immense scale that must have been a mark of imperial authority. Again, why are people constructing this? Again, when I when I mean people, I'm basically referring to kings. Why are kings constructing such huge temples? And upon that, there is even longer Gopurams and Mandapas. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of investment. But honestly speaking, there's no use. Right? Because all of these Mandapas, Gopurams and the Shikaras and all, you can't enter a Shikara. You can't go inside a Shikara. It's, it's solid. You, you just have to like look at it from outside. Right? So then what is the use? Why are they constructing it? As simple, right? Because they wanted to show their might, power, resources, all of these gold, wealth and all that stuff and portray to the other people and other kingdoms that don't underestimate us. We are powerful. We are richer. And that is why we have been able to construct so many Gopurams and Mandapas with so huge investment. That's the underlying point that they wanted to convey. Um, then we have Gopuras. Then also we have Royal Gateways. Gateway is like a normal door. But the door in itself is so huge. It's highly decorated. We have all of these sculptors, arcs, domes and stuff. So these things like Gopuras and Gateways, they actually dwarf the towers of the central shrine. Right? Again, roughly, let's say this is the size of the actual shrine in the temple. The Gopurams and Mandapas are this huge. Double, triple, almost like four times the size of the central shrine. In that case, the central shrine is not holding any importance right now. Instead, all of the um, attraction or all of the interest is being driven towards these Gopurams and gateways. Right? So, even if a person is like a kilometer away and there's no obstructions in between, that person can actually see the temple's gopura. That's how huge it is. Right? So, yeah. They were also probably meant as reminders of the power of kings. The exact point I was mentioning right now. That is exactly the reason why they constructed. Other distinctive features include mandapas or um, pavilions and long pillared corridors that often ran around the shrines within the temple complex. Right? Again, we're just describing the basic features of temples and yeah, some of them had particular uses, some of them did not have any use. But nonetheless, as a whole, the temples looked very, very aesthetic. Yeah? Okay, since we're talking a lot about temples right now and how huge structures they are, let's closely look at two of them, which is Virupaksha temple, the major god we have seen till now. And the other is Vitala temple. Again, we haven't come across this god Vitala, but we'll see what that is. So, this Virupaksha temple was actually built over centuries, right? When I mean by built over centuries, it, it first started out its construction in 9th, 10th centuries. Right? Whoever was ruling back in those times, they were they started the construction of these temples. But yeah, like they just built the central shrine or like the main complex and left it over there. But when Vijayanagaras took over in the 14th, 15th century, which is four centuries later, they modified this temple. They gave it a new shape 
they built it so many gopurams mandapas huge towers yeah so they gave it like a totally new shape that means the temple have been under construction for so many years right so that's what i mean and the hall in front of the main shrine was built by krishna devaraya and why did he built it when he actually became the king when he assessed the throne he wanted to mark that mov- moment like he wanted to celebrate that moment that's why he ordered for the construction of a hall in the main shrine in front of the main shrine yeah and this was decorated with delicately carved pillars right huge sculptures amazing sculptures he is also credited with the construction of the eastern gopuram a temple sometimes might have not just one but number of gopurams out of that eastern gopuram is constructed by krishna devaraya of the virupaksha temple right these additionals meant that the central shrine came to occupy a relatively small part of the complex that is exactly the point i was making earlier right because there are so many huge structures nobody is noticing this small shrine the small central main shrine anymore yes so uh, basically they have been over overpowering the central shrine okay uh, any questions still here before we move on to the next one guys at any point of time you'll have any questions please feel free to ask because after this we won't be doing any sort of revisions for chapter 7 saloni uh, good evening the class starts at 6 saloni so it's already almost been like 40 minutes the class started that's okay we still have another half an hour to go you can sit and listen now uh okay so we're still talking about virupaksha i was mentioning that there was there was this particular hall built in front of the main shrine by krishna devaraya this hall was actually used for so many purposes it's not it had like a multi purpose hall right sometimes um sorry about that yeah so these spaces or these halls where um the images of the gods were placed right only in special situations not every day every day these statues of gods were not there but in under special situations or special events these statues of gods were placed in that hall and different activities like music dance drama theater like any other forms of worshiping all of these special events used to happen uh, when the statue of the god is placed outside in the hall others were used to celebrate the marriage of deities sometimes that also used to happen or sometimes this hall was just like a chilling spot right where devotees basically came to the temple sat there for a while for peace for worshiping whatever they sat for a while they had their own time with themselves and they left again recreational activity so that is why i was saying it was a multi purpose hall if i can call it so yeah okay so that's what that's the content we have for virupaksha temple moving on we have something else called as vitala temple the second temple we were going to be talking about that that's also a very important and interesting shrine so who is vitala so this vitala is basically a form of vishnu right other than the 10 dashavataras that vishnu has in some other local traditions vishnu also has different avatars so out of that vitala is one and this vitala was basically worshiped in the maharashtra region which doesn't have anything to do with vijayanagara empire surprising right then how did vitala come to karnataka from maharashtra we'll look at that so this introduction of the worship of the deity in karnataka is basically telling us that vijayanagara rulers 
they were so intrigued by other traditions other cultures they want their main aim was to create an imperial culture like a mix of cultures that is why they borrowed this vitala from maharashtra and introduced him to the local karnataka audience right so as in the case of other temples this vitala temple also had so many halls and it had a great uh, shrine but this shrine is different from other temples why because the shrine of vitala temple is des- designed as a chariot all of us know chariots right chariot is like a cart pulled either by some animal like horse or elephant or something uh, what do you call it i think we call it rath in hindi yeah so the shrine is in the form of a chariot uh, in vitala temple the characteristic features of the vitala complexes is the chariot streets again the point mentioned here is let's say this is a temple complex a temple it is well connected to the roads because there are roadways running in this direction this direction this one like every possible direction the roads from the vitala temple go in every direction it's well connected to the city that's what we mean right and these streets were paved with stone slabs and lined with pillared pavilions in which merchants set up their shops again let's say if you're going to this direction from the temple you have all of these small shops on either sides of the road right so whenever if anybody is visiting this temple if they want to buy something they'll buy and go to the temple let's say coconuts because we usually break coconuts in the temple or flowers or um, certain other things required for rituals and all it's not just about the rituals but we had like garment shops uh, jewelry shops like mar- market right like normal shops so while going back home from the temple people could shop here and then go back to their homes right so that was uh, how the streets or the temp- the shop complexes around the vitala temple were just as the nayakas continued with and elaborated on traditions of fortification so they did with the traditions of temple building again i think in the last class we were seeing how fortified walls is like a huge thing for vijayanagara people even after uh, vijayanagara empire collapsed the people the the kings coming after that also followed this tradition of fortification in the same manner temple building also remained such an important activity that even after vijayanagara empire uh, was disbanded or demolished the other kings also continued this process of temple building right honestly speaking in fact most of these gopurams which are still there right which which haven't been in ruins and if you visit hampi today you'll actually find them these were actually constructed by the local nayakas themselves but not the vijayanagara kings because whatever vijayanagara kings constructed all of that is gone in the 1565 battle of tallikota deccani sultanate destroyed everything right so whatever is remaining is basically post 1565 work yeah okay um so that again brings us to the end of um re- uh, sorry sacred center so any questions till there any questions guys feel free to ask but if there are none then we can move on to talking about the other um, sub theme okay i don't see any i'll continue therefore so the next one's plotting places temples and bazaars so that's the history of vijayanagara empire whatever we have still seen till now now we'll actually talk about how this city has been discovered or invented in the first place it has been in ruins right after 1565 nobody used it until 1800 when actually colin mckenzie first discovered it and drew a first map right so while this 
process of reconstructing history is going on what actually happened like were there any struggles to reconstruct history or was it fairly a simple process what was involved so honestly speaking we have so many photographs plans drawings elevations of sculptures uh, structures their ruins right everything is available to us but how were all of these things produced in the first place right so the answer to that is after the initial surveys by mckenzie in the early 1800s he also referred to some other travelers accounts and inscriptions yeah for example domingo pais um a barbaza like everybody like who just came and visited vijayanagara empire and while they were here they actually wrote down something about how the empire is running right so mckenzie studied all of those books travelers accounts and he tried to make some connections and that's how he came up with the with his own reports and stuff archaeological reports um that was mckenzie's contribution and moving on to the 20th century we actually see that the site of hampi or the site of vijayanagara city um is preserved by the archaeological survey of india it is also assisted by karnataka department of archaeology and museums these two departments have been putting in a lot of effort to um, preserve this place of hampi what do we mean by preserve we basically saying that if there are any sort of uh, developmental activities like say i am a businessman i want to take permission from the government to destroy all of these temples destroy the city of hampi and um, construct a mall or something or construct a theater yeah that's how developmental activities take place right you take permission from the government you destroy the already existing site and build your new one but when i say that this place is preserved by the archaeological survey of india nobody has the right to construct something there even if i go and ask the government saying i want to construct a mall or something here government will not give me permission to destroy this because it is reserved it is preserved and, um, and protected by the archaeological survey of india right that happened in the 20th century in the same 20th century to be very specific in 1976 hampi was also recognized as a site of national importance right so something being recognized as a national important site or recognized by unesco stuff like that is very very crucial right it is an important thing for the temple and the place in general right so hampi gained that importance in 1976 and moving on to early 1980s a couple of uh, years down the line an important project was launched to document the material remains at vijayanagara in detail it's time right because as time passes by and you keep neglecting hampi without reconstructing histories it will vanish at some point of time somebody will rob whatever inscriptions are there they'll be slowly erased because of cold because of weather conditions some random things because of time all of these things will be destroyed so in order for us not to face that situations there was a huge project which was launched in the early 1980s yeah where a set of scholars are deployed and um, they were made to write down everything which they can see they were made to document everything right surveys were done field works were done interviews were done different techniques were used finally people actually came up with reports on hampi which is a good thing for historians yeah okay um of course uh, again the classes are going to be only in english of course because i myself am not personally equipped with hindi as a language so i don't really know how to speak hindi so yeah it's going to be only in english
okay so in 1980s that development happened and over nearly 20 years that's a lot of time right because honestly speaking for any other archaeological site hardly three or maximum five years of work will be done like archaeological field work and then they'll give up because five years in itself is a lot the archaeologist is already very much tired looking at the same place for years and years to come but when it comes to Hampi, not 5, not 10, but 20 years, and that to not one scholar. Dozens and dozens of scholars were recruited from all around the world who had amazing expertise in this field to compile and preserve the information of Hampi. Because that's how important the place is. It's culturally important. Right? These detailed sur uh, surveys have been extremely painstaking. Obviously, they are painful because... If somebody asks you or me to go to a place and stay there for, um, I don't know, like 20 years by observing the same thing daily and not do anything else. That's your job. We're paying, for, paying you for it. I don't think nobody will do it, right? That's like literally wasting 20 years of your life. So therefore, it is painstaking. And also, there's no guarantee that you will find something. If you are too unlucky, too unfortunate, even though you stay there the whole of your life, you won't find anything. You can't invent anything. Right? So, there are disappointing days, there are low days. It's extremely a painstaking job. Right? But nonetheless, people have stayed there. Some days, they didn't find anything, but they were not demotivated. They went back to the same plot again the next day. And that's how they were able to construct all of these little, little details starting from ruins of the shrines to residences of common people to elaborate temples everything was documented right roads were documented paths were documented bazaars shops where where were they when they were actually there everything everything was documented that's a good thing again for the archaeologists okay um Yeah, so it is worth remembering something that John M. Fritz, George Michael and M. S. Nagraj Rao. So these three are only pe are people who actually stayed at this site for 20 years and started collecting information, right? Those set of scholars, dozens of scholars for 20 years. While leaving or while they're actually documenting their accounts, somewhere they mention this particular thing. It, it, this is an excerpt from their document. They say that in our study of these monuments of Vijayanagara, we have to imagine a whole series of vanished wooden, wooden elements. Right? Um, again, what do we mean by this? Let's let's normally take like wooden wooden things, right? Wooden things won't stay for long. Yeah? At some point of time, they'll be ruined because of weather conditions, because of some sort of fungi grow, growing on it, right? Because of external factors, wooden doesn't last long. So in such cases, the wooden material, whatever was used in these temples and monuments of Vijayanagara, everything is gone. So in such situations, these scholars who were interrogating, they have to imagine that, oh, once upon a time, a wooden block was there. Or a wooden beam was there. And then they have to like imagine stuff and write it down. Again, it's a, it's a difficult job. Looking at something right in front of you and then writing it down in itself is a difficult job. But imagine something which is not in front of your eyes. But still you have to imagine it and write about it. That too accurately because everybody can have access to this information. That's a difficult job. Right? Okay, so wooden structures are obviously lost. But on the other hand, if you see that, if you, if you look at the stone structures, stone is basically not perishable. It will stay for millions and millions of years. So million, uh, stone structures basically survive. Right? So whatever little structures are remaining, the stone ones, 
then we have textual sources, then we have a little bit of inscriptions, whatever information is available to us, we have clubbed all of those, again, historians have clubbed all of those, and they came up with a certain narrative of Vijayanagara history, or how vibrant the empire was back in those times. Right? So, yeah, that's how they reconstructed Vijayanagara. And finally, we have the last sub-theme, which is questions in search of answers. Uh, give me five to seven minutes, guys. I'll wind this class up. So the last sub-theme is questions in search of answers. Buildings, which actually are there, like they survive right now. They tell us a lot of things. They tell us what the architectural style is, how they were organized, how normally the spaces were used in Vijayanagara Empire, what material was used to build, what technique was used to build, and stuff like that. Right? For example, now we're looking at the fortifications of Vijayanagara city. We'll obviously come to a conclusion that, okay, the mere fact that so many fortification walls are there, probably so much of military activity was also there, pro probably so much, there was, a there was a need for defense requirements. That is why people constructed so many fortifications. Otherwise, why will they construct? So that's what I mean by looking at a certain thing and then developing a whole narrative around it. Right? That, that's, we have information about that. Uh, sometimes buildings also tell us the spread of ideas and cultural influences. Right? When we're trying to compare these buildings with other buildings, they give us some sort of information. Um, also, like whoever is building the, these temples or the patrons of these temples, according to their wishes, according to their ideas only, these temples were built, right? So we are able to understand what their choices were. Even though the person is not alive, the person is dead, but looking at the architectural styles, we are able to figure out that, okay, Krishna Devaraya probably liked this sort of architecture. That is why he built this temple in this particular architectural style. So some, some sort of information like that is also available and they are often suffused with symbols which are a product of their cultural context, right? Again, these symbols and stuff you'll only understand when you're trying to um, read the textual sources at the same time, right? So contextualizing these symbols is very, very important. We have textual sources, that, so that's not a problem. Uh, keep them side by side, relate stuff, and then you'll get the answers for it. Right? So that's, that's the information which we know. But what about the information which we don't know? We'll look at that in the next slide. So investigations of architectural features, yeah, like when you're looking at these same architectural pieces, it does not tell us a lot of history because history is not just about the elite people it's not just about the kings or rich people right ordinary people were also there men women children uh, traders like lower people poor people ordinary people right their histories are also histories but these architectural features do not tell us anything about their lives right like there are a few questions which are unanswered, right? Let's say probably um, wherever these temples are constructed, were ordinary people allowed to go and visit, visit these temples in the first place? Can they enter the royal center or can they enter the sacred center? No answer. Would they? We don't have an answer, right? Because we, we don't have information about it. And also the second question is, let's say there's a temple right here at some place and I'm trying to go past the temple to my destination, whatever it is. Do I actually have the time to stop in front of the temple, to look at it, to reflect on it and try to understand whatever is written on the temple or whatever is carved on the temple, its sculptures and stuff. Do I have so much time or I'm in my own world and I'll just like randomly go past it without even noticing it. I don't know, we don't have the answer for that again. The next one is, um, what did pe again, there are some 
workers or laborers who actually put in so much of work to construct these temples or other sculptures what did they think of they uh, were they proud that oh my god we are a part of the construction of such huge structures were they proud about it or they were like there's no use of these why are we even wasting our time constructing these two different reactions right but we don't know what they thought so these architectural features do not tell us what ordinary people thought but it only gives us an idea as to what the elite people and kings thought right so um there comes the problem and finally the last slide of the class and the chapter while rulers took all important decisions about the buildings to be constructed right obviously it's rule ruler's choice what is the style used to be where should be constructed what is the material that is supposed to be used to construct these buildings what architectural style should be followed everything was decided by the king or the ruler but what about the people who actually possessed this knowledge for constructing king can't construct it right because king doesn't know how to do it you need bricks you need cement you need different like different things uh for example we need engineers for planning the construction of temple who did all of these who drew plans for the buildings from where did the uh, workers come from we needed sculptors we needed stone cutters masons from where did they come from were they people of vijayanagara empire itself or when usually wars used to happen we take in war captives right so were these workers war captives like prison prisoners were they paid for their work or was it forced labor and is there some sort of supervision for this kind of building like when the activity is taking place was there any supervisor and let's say for example you needed sandstone or marble to construct these temples from where did you get the raw material from which place was it locally available did you get it from somewhere we don't have answers to any of these questions right the basic answer is no we don't have information right there's so much to be discovered yet this is not the only history we have there's so much to be discovered so many questions are left unanswered right by just looking at the building you can't answer all of these questions therefore continuous research is necessary in the 20th century 21st i don't know let's move to 22nd century then also we are not sure whether we'll be able to identify the answers to these questions right so that's the pace at which history operates right there's still a lot of speculation there's still scope for so many other things um, to be discovered yeah so um yeah um there's one okay that basically brings us to the end of the class guys so any questions regarding anything please uh, let me know in the chat box we will quickly answer because this is going to be the last class uh, for this chapter and i have one important announcement to make uh within 2 minutes i'll make the announcement but yeah uh, i'll try i'll just try to wind this up in case you all have questions please uh, let me know uh, yeah there's something called as bugs bounty it's basically an opportunity for all the learners to report any inappropriate content in the video you can be the first one to report and claim a prize for that and there's a form in the description you can use that form to um, report this inappropriate content and uh, yeah thanks guys thanks for attending the class uh if you like the content of these videos please do like it share it as much as possible and also subscribe to the channel an academy thank you uh okay uh, so regarding the uh important announcement that, that i was supposed to make so guys um uh, this is the last day i'll be here so um tomorrow also i'll be here but it's not a class for you guys it's basically a class for 11 standard students so this is the last class that i was supposed to take for you guys i 
honestly had fun teaching all of you all for uh, all of these four for the past four five months it was great interacting with so many of you all uh it was honestly nice and i had great time in uh, sharing my knowledge with you taking your pointers and guiding you all throughout even i learned so much from you guys as well so i have been grateful for this and i will truly cherish this all my life but that being said this is the last class so i just wanted to thank all of you out there for attending the classes uh, every alternate day sincerely dedicatedly at 6 pm um yeah so that's all i have to say and th- thank you thank you is the only word i have right now thanks guys thanks so much uh yeah bye everyone and i'm hoping at some point of time in some other different form probably we'll get to meet again but until then uh take care guys uh it was fun having you around take care and all the best for your exams ace them nothing to worry about i kind of know that most of you are stressed about it but honestly speaking you need not worry it's just mcq based you'll do well i'm confident you will do well so just keep revising just keep going through these sessions um take as many quizzes as possible solve so many mock papers and stuff you'll get through it amazingly well all the best for your boards all the best for your 12th standard and also i'm hoping all of you all will get into a uh, nice colleges in the future thank you thank you so much and take care